Glory to Jesus. Well, we've had some day here, times per church. The Lord's been here, manifest presence of Jesus, and we've had a good time. Amen. Okay, that's fine. Praise the Lord. Uh, tonight, I want to speak to you on the subject, have you felt like giving up lately? Have you felt like giving up lately? I, I announced this this morning, and three or four people said, no. I thought, then, well, why should I preach it? If, uh, but I think they were thinking of giving up on the Lord, and that's not, they would not think of giving up on the Lord. I must say, I've had a battle about this message, whether or not to preach it. I had two, one on prayer, and I went home this afternoon and struggled and struggled in prayer, and the Lord made it clear that if there were only one or two in this service tonight that needed this, it would save their lives, literally save them from hell and save them for the Lord lest they run, unless they literally give up. And God would go fishing for one person. He'd make everybody else sit and listen for one person if he's after in love. He'll not let them go. And I do know that God wants to speak to somebody here tonight. Maybe you're a visitor. Maybe it's for somebody that attends this church. But you're on the verge of giving up, not on the Lord. But you're in a position now where you may even try to run. You've contemplated running, perhaps. You say, I can't take it anymore. I've had it. It's enough. Could be one of the fellows from... Timothy House and one of the girls from the Hanna House who said, I just can't make it. And the Lord's going to save you from the lies of the devil tonight and set you free. And you'll not walk out on him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Heavenly Father, come now, I need you. Holy Spirit, take these few loaves and fishes and multiply it and bring food and life to those who need it tonight. Hide me, Jesus. Hide me behind yourself. Let the words of my mouth, meditation of my heart, and everything that I am and all that I have exude Jesus. Let Christ be seen and heard from my heart and my lips tonight. Lord, give me a shepherd's heart to speak this, Lord, kindly and lovingly as from you on a, a life and death mission. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, I have taken your authority, not mine, but your authority, over every principality and power of darkness, so that nothing, nothing hinders the word of the Lord. This simple word, as it goes into the heart, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Is it possible for righteous, godly, holy people to get so low, so downcast, that they feel like they can't go on, and they come to the brink of giving up. Is it possible for those who are so close to Jesus, they know his heart and they, his mind, they have seen miracles, they have been prayer warriors, they've seen victory after victory. Is it possible for a very pious, holy, righteous, godly, spirit-filled people to get so downcast that they say, God, you've forsaken me? Lord, I'm not going to go on unless you deliver me. Is it possible to get so low in a pit like that, even though you're righteous? Well, let's talk about it. Let's think of Job, first of all. Here was a man God himself said was perfect and upright and feared God and avoided evil. Would to God it could be said of me, any one of us here tonight, perfect and upright, and one who fears God and shuns evil, runs from compromise and runs from sin. But this godly man was going through a crisis of his life. He'd lost everything and he was covered with boils from head to toe and he came to a place where he could not take it anymore. He had three so-called comforters, babysitters I call them, who came and tried to tell him why he was suffering. And Job cried out, he said, for the arrows of the Almighty are within me. The poison whereof drinks up my spirit. The terrors of God do set themselves in array against me. Oh, that I might have my request and that God would grant me the one thing I long for, even that it would please God to destroy me, that he would loose his hands and cut me off. 
He said, there's only one thing I want left in life, and I want God to cut me off. I have had it. I want to die. Now, this is a righteous man. He didn't sin whatsoever. There's not a known sin. God didn't allow the enemy to come to him because he had sin in his life. He was righteous and perfect before God, and yet God allows him to go through this pit of despair where he despaired even of life. Job was ready to give up. Life had become unbearable. He said, weariness, uh, wearisome nights have been appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I rise and the night be gone? In other words, he said, I go to bed at night and I can't wait for the morning. I have the daylight and I can't wait for the night. He said, and I toss to and fro till the dawning of the day. And in despair, Job cried out, my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my life. I loathe my life. I would not live anymore. Let me alone for my days are vanity. I'm a burden to myself. And uh, neither Job nor the so-called comforters could understand why God would allow a righteous man to suffer. And this is the perennial question in the church and in the world especially. You know, you're supposed to, when God, you give your heart to God, you give your life to Jesus, you give everything to Him, and uh, the world will say, all you're going to get is suffering. And a lot of Christians can't understand when they have done everything right before God, living right, loving the Lord, praying. Why does God allow those times of despair and trouble? All kinds of trouble. Job's got trouble. He's got problems that are, are unsolvable. There's no way he can figure his way out. He's at the end of his rope. He's at wit's end. And his, his comforters kept lecturing him. And they said, Job, God doesn't afflict the righteous. And then he, they went on to say, if you have iniquity in you, Job, put it off. Forsake your wickedness. How would you like to be told that when you are trying to understand what you're going through and here are supposed men of God around you saying, Job, you're going through that because you've got something hidden in your life. Now, I'm with it, Job. Tell us. Confess it and all your troubles will disappear. And that's what the devil would like to be, have you be convinced of, that you're suffering or you're in trouble because there's sin. Examine yourself and when you lay it down, all's going to pass away and everything's going to become roses. Not so. Not so at all. That's not Job's problem. In fact, Job turned to God in his despair. He heard this from these men. And he's in turmoil of spirit. And he says, God, thou knowest that I'm not a wicked man. Show me why you are contending with me. Because my soul is weary of my life. He said, at least tell me what your argument is. Why are you angry at me? He was convinced that God was angry with him. Was God angry with him? Not at all. God was loving this man. God would, he would have loved to step in at any moment. And, and he stood with this man. But he had to, he had to give him this time of testing and trial. Here are some of the things that Job said in his crisis. And I think they'll sound familiar to some of you. I think most of us at one time or another said, Similarly, uh, similar things. Maybe not in these words, but in essence, this is what your heart was saying. Job says, God, are you pouring me out like milk? Are you curdling me like cheese? You got me all stirred up and I'm going sour. I'm full of confusion. Lord, why do you hide your face and hold me for your enemy? He said, you appear to me not to be my friend now, but my enemy. You're standing against me. The trouble I'm in, the confusion I'm in, my physical pain. Why Why is my body suffering? Why, why have you taken my children? You took everything I have. Oh God, are you my enemy now? And he said, my face is red with weeping and my eyelids, in my, on my eyelids is the shadow of death. God... You have fenced me in. I can't go anywhere. He said, I'm, I can't pass. There's no, nothing I can do. He said, you've set darkness in my path. Those that I've loved have turned against me. Somebody, please have pity on me. That's Job 19, 19 and 21. Someone have pity. He looked around. God, anybody, I'm in trouble. Please, somebody have pity on me. Have you ever been there? 
I said, have you ever been there? Yes. Now you're getting honest. What about this great and holy prophet of God called Jeremiah, the weeping prophet who, who spoke to nations around the world, this man who walked with God. He had his ear tuned to heaven. He had a pipeline right into the throne of God. This man shook people to the core. There was nobody could stand against the power and authority of this man. What a bold, bold prophet he is. <clears throat> Yet still this godly prophet came to total despair. God allowed him to experience something that uh, few people have experienced. Now, his despair started because the devil came and convinced him that he was a deceived man. He, he somehow got into deception and that he was being mocked and ridiculed by the multitudes because somehow he had been deceived. In fact, he says, oh, Lord, you've deceived me and I've been deceived. I'm in derision and mockery every day. Everyone mocks me. Somehow the devil had planted a seed in his mind that, that he was under some kind of deception. Folks, has the devil ever tried to put that lie in your mind that you are deceived? That, that, that there's some kind of deception in you? The reason you're going through the downcast and the blues and the depression is that there's deception in your life? Your heart is deceived? You're living a lie? Mm hmm He said, cursed be the day when I was born. Can you imagine this great man of God? This Jeremiah who thundered the prophecies of a holy God. And listen to him. Cursed be the day when I was born. Cursed be the man who brought tidings to my father saying, a man child is born to you. Making him very glad. Let that man be as the cities which the Lord overthrew. Because he slew me not from the womb. Or that my mother might have been my grave. And her womb to be always great with me. Wherefore came I forth out of the womb. To see just labor and sorrow. That my day should be consumed with shame. He said, why wasn't my mother's womb my grave? Why didn't I die at birth? Why did God bring me out of the womb if he's going to let me be deceived and let me go through such rejection? This man was suffering from the, 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 the sense of being rejected. Folks, I don't care how, how great a man of God or woman you may be. If you face constant, constant rejection, it's going to get on your physical mind. It's going to tear your mind down. It, 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 it has to happen. And it happened with this great man of God. Can you believe what you hear from the lips of this great prophet when he's overwhelmed by affliction? He's so down, he's so full of despair, he wishes to die. In fact, Job, when he was at the very bottom, he cried out, God, why is life given to him that's in misery? And why do you give life to the bitter in soul? which rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave. He, he said, all I want to do is find out how I can die. How to get out of this trouble that I'm in. He said, why did you give me all this light and then turn it off? Why should I be in such darkness? And here's Jeremiah saying, I, I've been deceived. This man is as low and down as a prophet of God or a man of God can get. So it was with the godly prophet Elijah. You talk about a man who knows the mind of God. This is the man. This is the man that stood on Mount Carmel and slew those prophets of Baal. This is the man who, who laid over a dead child and brought life to that child. Here's a man who told the woman, you break me, you, 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 you make me, uh, a loaf of bread. You, you cook that for me first and God will take care of you. And a barrel of meal never went dry. This is a man of miracles. This is a man who's seen great things of God done. And now he's up on the, up on the mountain and the, you talk about a miracle. First of all, he prayed to heaven shut. 
Now, folks, think about that for just a minute. He said, it's not going to rain again, Ahab, until I tell you. I shut the heavens. No more rain, according to my word, because I stand before God. This man had been shut in with God. When he said, I stand before God, it means I've been on my knees. I live on my face before a holy God. And he said, it's not going to rain until I say so. You talk about power. I listen to some of the modern evangelists today boasting in their advertising. Come see a man of great power. Not one of them has ever shut the heavens. This man shut the heavens. Then he opens the heavens. And he prays in the heavens. It begins to rain. This man in his 80s outruns Ahab's chariot. I wouldn't even walk that far. I know Carter couldn't. He was out of breath preaching this morning. <laughs> Look how red he's got in there. But think of this man. What a prophet. He, he pours 12 barrels of water over the, the altar and calls fire down out of heaven. What a sight. How, what goes through a, mind, a man's mind when he sees God do these great things? I know it had to humble him. I know he never boasted about it. But, but what happens? In, you, you say, well, a man who has all these miracles happening in his life surely could not allow any fear or doubt or depression in his life. Surely a man that has done all these great things, all he has to do is recall the miracles and that will override all of his fears. It will override anything that comes into his life. No, no. There comes a time when all past miracles, all past blessings cannot help you in your present hour. I mean, somebody can tell you, I, I have been with people that have been mightily used of God, even ministers and their wives, greatly pe people greatly used of God, who've seen great miracles, and down they go into this pit of despair and despondency that we're talking about. And, and they're, they're saying, there's no use. I'm a failure. I don't feel like uh, I've done anything. And total despair is on them. And, and I've often lectured them, so wait a minute. Think of all the things God's done for you. Count your blessing. And I'll stand there lecturing them. Stupid me. And, and lecturing them as if to say, if you'll just go back and count your blessings, that'll help you through your present trial. Now, theologically, that's correct and it should work. But often it doesn't work and it didn't work with this prophet. Didn't work at all. You could have gone to Elijah. When, uh, when he goes now, he, he is, he'd been praying for revival so much. He had given his life for revival in Judah and Israel. He lived for it and now he sees reformation. He's convinced the revival is here. And he outruns Ahab's chariot and Jezebel... But kills the revival instantly. Just absolutely destroys what he thought was revival. And he runs for his life. Now, folks, this man runs into the wilderness and sits on a juniper tree. He says, Lord, I gave my all and it blew up in my face. This poor dejected prophet, he shuts down for 40 Days and 40 nights. No past memory of any miracle. What God did for him with that raising that dead boy, that barrel that never went dry, that great miracle of water, all the death of the prophets of Baal. He knew that Baal was dead and the worship of Baal was dying. And yet there's something that came over this man of, de of, re of dejection and despondency. It was a spiritual matter. It was not physical. It was mental depression. It was in the mind. Folks, it's not... No, no, a lot of people get depressed because they have physical problems. If you wake up every day with physical pain, it wears on you. 
I don't know what kind of combination this was, but this man was in mental anguish. And finally, God ends up after 40 days and said, sir, what are you doing here? He says, well, I'm the only one left, God. If, if that's all God has left, a dejected prophet hiding out, God helped the world. But God loved this man. God loved this prophet. He didn't rebuke him. And I'll tell you, it was that still small voice that brought him out. That still small voice. Folks, I live with that still small voice. We heard it this afternoon. That little still small voice took on thunder and said, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be ashamed. Your sins are under the blood. Hallelujah. That should have brought the whole church out. If you were here this afternoon, you should have been lifted out of any kind of depression if you stood on faith by what was preached here. Hallelujah. Elijah ends up finally hearing that still small voice and he's delivered. You say, well, brother, that's Old Testament. What about the New Testament time? Well, this is the day of grace. Surely Christians are full of the Holy Ghost. Those We have the Holy Spirit now. We have a greater measure of revelation. Surely we who have a high priest, we who have the sprinkling of the blood upon us, we who have an intercessor, we who have a mediator, those, the covenant and all the things of the New Testament, surely we shouldn't be living in fear. There should be no Christian get down. There should be no depression in the house of God. Folks, I believe in rejoicing. We can rejoice when we're sorrowful. I preached about that last Sunday afternoon. And I believe that God can bring you to a place of rejoicing. But there comes a time. There'll come a season. Now, some of you may not have had it. I, I thank God for all the people who, who don't have any downtime. They're always smiling. Now, folks, you don't have to go out and try to invent something so you can suffer with the saints to try to be uh, an overcomer. You don't have to wait for it. It'll come. You don't go looking for it. It'll find you. And some of you here now, and it has found you. But what about the New Testament? What about Holy Ghost people who are on their knees, who love God, who are giving their lives, they're serving the Lord, they're not walking in sin? Wholly dedicated to the Lord. Well, Paul the Apostle can answer that for you. Oh, yes, he can. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, please. 2 Corinthians, and this is where I'm starting to preach now. Second Corinthians, first chapter. Verse 7. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as we are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. Now look at me, please. Listen to this godly man. This, this, this man who has given the, up the whole world, he considered everything in his life but dung that he may win Christ. Here's a man who's had Jesus revealed in him, not to him, but in him. Here's a man that was taken into the third heavens and saw revelations that it was, it was so glorious, he was forbidden to talk about it. He saw marvelous things. Here's a man who's been given the mystery of the gospel. This, this, is, this is a man who has given us the epistles. Here's the man who, who has taught us. He had the revelation of Jesus Christ like no other living man on earth. And yet this man goes to Asia. And God uses him in Asia, in Ephesus. There's a great revival for two years. The Lord comes down in Ephesus. Great miracles. In fact, miracles so great. The conviction of the Holy Ghost so strong that they gathered up all their books and their curious arts and had a bonfire, 50,000 pieces of silver worth. That meant thousands and thousands of our dollars. People brought all of their occult books and burned them in the city square. 
a great revival broke out. God used Paul in a marvelous way. But in the middle of that revival, there were some silversmiths who were carving these little silver images of the goddess Diana. The goddess Diana was being worshipped in Asia and especially in Ephesus. And many of them were turning to Jesus. They were not buying the silver statues anymore. And they stood up against Paul, the apostle. And they riled up the crowds against him. And he finally he winds up after two years of giving his life to this revival. This great moving of God in Ephesus and other parts of Asia. So powerful that people were bringing uh, their handkerchiefs and their aprons and uh, Paul was anointing them. They were sending these aprons and handkerchiefs out and people were being healed when those handkerchiefs had been laid on their bodies. People were instantly being healed. Great work of God. And in the middle of it, this riot breaks out. They drag Paul into the theater and he's trying to struggle for his life. Now, nobody knows what Paul went through in Asia. We don't know whether um, some... Uh, theologians and, and uh, students uh, believe that Paul was going through a great physical battle at the time that he was sick nigh unto death that have you ever been that you got so sick you wanted to die I said how many have been sick enough you thought you'd rather die than go oh come on my goodness we don't know what it was but Paul said that when he was in Asia, there was trouble that came into his life, so much so that he was pressed out of measure, above strength, and it got so bad, he said, in so much, it was so bad, he says, that I despaired of life. I wanted to die, is what he's saying. I had the sentence of death. It was so bad, I was saying, oh God, it's all over. I'm going to die. I'm not going to make it. I'm not coming out of this. The sentence of death was on us. When he says us, he's speaking of himself. And Paul, now folks, I, I know something I believe about what Paul was going through. I don't believe it was just physical sickness, and I don't believe it was just rejection of the, of, of the worshipers of Diana. I believe it's more than that. There's a mental anguish. Some of you women know what the mental anguish is. You can't explain it. It can come upon you almost any time. You can't explain it. It's just a lot of things that pile up. It can be finances. It can be children. It can be marriage relationship. It can be almost anything. And these things accumulate. And one day you wake up. You went to bed. You were fine. You wake up in the morning. And this has been the testimony of some of the godliest, holiest people on earth in history. That out of nowhere, this despair, this despondency comes upon you. And you can't explain it. Nobody can touch you. Nobody can heal you, and all you want to do is hide or run. You don't want to talk to anybody. You, you can call it what you want. They, they put names uh, on it. You know, women get especially tagged with all kinds of physical uh, ailments trying to explain this depression. Now, the physical side, yes, that can contribute to it, but that's not all of it. The enemy can come in like a flood. The enemy can come and try to destroy you mentally and physically. He can just come. Folks, some of the things that you go through, you can't explain it physically. From the powers of hell arrayed against you, coming to absolutely destroy you. And you can find yourself in just a few hours down in a pit, and you can't explain it. You can't explain it. And Paul says, I, he said, I'm not, I don't want you to be ignorant of this. What I went through in Asia. Now he's trying to tell them, I came out of it. And what I learned out of that, I'm going to share with you so that you can be healed. He said, whatever I go through, I get consolation so that I can console you by the Holy Spirit and through my experiences. And I believe that pastors and ministers of the gospel go through many things that God allows so that they can learn it, so that when they get up to preach, they're not preaching theology, they're preaching from personal experience. And folks, I give you tonight not theology, I don't give you a book, I give you personal experience. I've been there. I know what it is to have it come 
out of nowhere. You can't explain it. But there, there comes a time you just walk around and you say, oh God, I can't take anymore. I can't take anymore, Lord. Some of you would run, but you don't know where to go. You have no place to go. You feel like running, but something holds you there. Uh huh. That's the Holy Spirit holding you, by the way. And they're going to let you run. David tried. He said, oh, I had wings like a dove. There have been times I wish I could fly. And go off to a desert. Yeah, you get the desert, you'll be so thirsty and hungry, you can't, you run home quick. But Paul the Apostle, Paul the Apostle, saying, it was so bad, I despaired of life. Now, now Paul said for, he, he, he took on the care of all these churches that he had pioneered, and he loved these people so much, and he had to correct them. And folks, that's a tremendous, painful thing for a man or woman of God to correct. And Paul says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. What you read here from Paul the Apostle, he wrote it with anguish in his heart, and it afflicted him, and it made him weep. And it took a toll on his physical body. It mental anguish. He had to write to these people who were compromising. He, it, it was like giving birth to a, a, a child. And he was in all of this pain, this mental anguish, all the cares of the churches. And Paul said, for when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings and within were fears. Now hold it right there. Paul the Apostle who spoke so much against victory, against fear. And he's saying, outside, everywhere I looked, there was turmoil. Turmoil. All around me. And inside my heart, I grew fearful. He said, inside, there was fear. Paul, the apostle, had fear. Now, folks, theologically, it shouldn't be so. But, folks, there comes a time... When fear, it's a spirit that comes right out of the pits of hell. And the devil will try to infuse it into your mind. He'll try to plant it in you. And you don't know why, but there's a fear upon you. You can have fear of cancer. You can have fear your children are going to die. You have all kinds of fears and, and satanic apparitions that come to your mind. The devil will try to get you to lose your confidence in God. And that you would come to a place where you doubt that God answers prayer. And that all of your fasting, all of your praying, all of your seeking God's been in vain. That's his design. But this man said we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves. Folks, I saw that the other day and I said, oh God, thank you that Paul the Apostle was so honest. Paul said, you know, here's what writes about it. He said, I don't trust Paul. I don't trust myself. If you're sitting here and you trust yourself, God help you. There's no good thing in you and me. Our hearts are abundantly wicked outside of the blood of Jesus Christ. And who can know it but God? He's the one who purifies. But what he purifies is not this fleshly heart. He purifies the spiritual heart of the new man. Hallelujah. The new man has that spiritual purity. Hallelujah. But this flesh, I have no confidence in it. Pastor Carter said it right. We're all capable at any time if God left us to our flesh to do anything sinful to the bottom of degradation other than the mercy of God. Hallelujah. Don't trust yourself. I remember a number of years ago, I think I told this in the pulpit. I used to minister with Sister Catherine Coleman. And this was in, in uh, Los Angeles. She, by the way, she was my song leader and I was the preacher. There were 5,000 in the audience. Place seated five and it was packed and people standing. And I had been going through a very, very difficult time. <clears throat> cancer in my... My wife's going through another cancer at the time. 
I had the burden of Teen Challenge. I've been traveling, been writing, and I was weary and tired. And the enemy comes at you when you're weary and tired. He always comes at that time. He doesn't dare come when you're spiritually high. He comes when you're low, physically, when you don't have the strength. And he came to me, and before the service, I'm sitting on stage, and Sister Coleman is directing the music, and there was some marvelous things happening in the meeting, and the enemy came and said, you are the biggest phony on the face of the earth. You are phony. You can't preach tonight because you are phony. You have no fire. You've lost the anointing. You're just going to get up there and be a chatterbox because you are a big phony. And it was so loud. I couldn't quiet it. And I tried to shake it off. And I got up to preach. And I, I tried for five minutes. Hardly anything would come out because in my subconscious mind, it was screaming. The devil was screaming at me. Dave Wilkerson, you're a phony. You're working with troubled people just to make a name for yourself. And look what's happening. Your wife's going to die. You give your life, and it's all vanity, and you're a phony. I tried and tried to preach, and I couldn't. I finally motioned to the sister, and, said, and I turned and walked off stage in front of 5,000 people, and I went backstage, and I just shook my head. She was, what's wrong, what's wrong? I said, I can't go on. I went backstage, and a pastor was back. He said, what's wrong? I said, I'm sorry, I can't preach. I'm a phony. He just dumbfounded, dumbfounded. Folks, it took me weeks. Jeremiah, 40 days, 40 nights. Sometimes it can hang on. God brought me out. Oh, and folks, I remember years later, the devil tried to play that on me, but he couldn't do it anymore. I said, you broke the record last time. I'm not going to play that one again. That's dead and gone. I don't ever let him call me a phony again. Never. <laughs> Has he ever called you a phony? Oh, he'll call you all kinds of names. Because he's a liar, the Bible said, and a father liar, and he's accuser of the brethren. One thing it did do, it took me down a couple notches and took a lot of pride out of my heart. So that every time I stood then, it was not in boldness of flesh, but in the fear of God. Hallelujah. I tell you that only because I believe somebody here tonight is going through that same kind of thing. You're going through it. You say, Brother Dave, how do I get out of it? Now, God told me, I, I waited for half an hour before I came up because I was in prayer and waiting on the Lord and what to say. And the Lord revealed to me back in that room that there, that I had to preach this tonight because there were a few that were on the brink of literally giving up on life that I was going to, through this message, going to save a few people literally from hell. Because if you went on without being lovingly taught and warned, you'd go on your way, you would give up, and the devil would get advantage, and you'd lose your faith in your soul. And he loves you too much, and he cares that he'll stop everything, and he'll have me zero in on you tonight by the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Because Paul the Apostle said, I'm not just preaching this, he said, it's a demonstration and power of the Holy Ghost. And this is demonstration of power of the Holy Ghost because He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. Others of you, it's not that you're despairing of life, but you have been tested beyond endurance. You're here now, and you have to say with Paul, trouble which come to me has pressed me out of measure. It's above my strength. It's beyond my strength. It's beyond my strength. You say, Brother David, what do I do? How do I get out of it? Well, all I know is how God brought me out and how he brings me out. Let, let me give it to you very quickly before we close here. All right? Number one, don't think you're experiencing some strange, unique battle. If you're going through it, you're in good company. Job, Jeremiah, Elijah, 
David, on and on and on. Paul the Apostle, David Wilkerson. Oh, you're in good company. Not not that, that I'm anything. Please. But I know what it is. And, and I know that when it comes... Remember, think it not strange concerning the fire trial, which is to try as though some strange thing has come upon you. But God will with the temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Hallelujah. It's not strange. It's not unusual. It's common. And don't sit here tonight saying, I, I, I am in this because I must have failed God. There's something deep inside of me. He, he's angry because I failed him. I don't have complete victory over a certain sin in my life. Or you, you are trying to figure out why you're going through it. Stop figuring it out. All right, let's go on. Number two, when you think you can't go on another hour and it looks absolutely hopeless, then cry as loud as you can to the Lord. Let it out. Folks, I came to the place, what I did, I had, I had my garage out here in Long Island where we lived, and I had my garage fixed up. I remember the green carpet on the floor, and I screamed, God help! At the top of my voice, and I walked around screaming, Help! There's no other help! Help! <laughs> I scared a thousand demons right away. Alright, get your Bibles. Come on, let's go quick. Psalms 18. It's the truth that sets you free. It's the Word now. Come on, we've got about five more minutes and we're finished, but I want you to get this, please. Psalms 18. You ready? Verse 1. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, the buckler, the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows of death compassed me in the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I what? I called upon the Lord and I cried. Help, Lord! Unto my God he heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him even to his ears. And then you read the rest. He said, God shook heaven and earth for me then. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. All right, go to uh, 30. Chapter 30. We're going to go real quick here now. Chapter 30. You ought to be marking these down. Chapter 30. Psalms 30. Verse 2. O oh Lord my God, I what? I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O oh Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive, that I should not go down into the pit. Is that the word of God or not? How did he get out? I cried unto the Lord. Alright, go to 31. Verse, chapter 31. Verse 22. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. That's what all these men had said. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplication when I cried unto thee. O Lord, O love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plenty rewardeth the proud doer. All right, go now to chapter 55. 55. Mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter is established. Chapter 55, verses 16 and 18. Look, verse 16. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I cry and cry how? Say it again. I said cry aloud, will you? Cry aloud. Oh, ho. Now, is that in your Bible? <laughs> Cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. The angels of the Lord were with me when I heard, the, when I cried. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to nail it down positively 
from the word of God that when you cry, you're going to get out. All right, I'm going to give you this. It's absolutely 100% foolproof. I want you to go to Psalm 72. One verse. Verse 12. 72, 12. If you have King James, read it with me. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. Again. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth. Hallelujah. Does that nail it down? All right. Now, number three. We're still going on. Hold your Bible open. You got into God's word, number three. You lay hold of a promise. Take it to the secret closet and hold God to it. You take the promises of God. Now, folks, I do that all the time. And I'm going to give you three of my favorite promises that I take into my secret closet and I hold God to these promises. I hold Him. He can't fail you. Are you ready? I give them to you. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you something I've used for a long, long time and I'm going to share it with you. I, I use this one every day. Matthew 7. Go to Matthew 7. This has helped me all for many, many years. This has been one of my favorite promises to take into the secret closet. Are you ready? Verse 9 to 11. Here we go. Verses 9 to 11. Uh, uh, verse 8. Let's start verse 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? Whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? If he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If then being evil, if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Folks, I hold this to God. I go to him and say, Lord, you told me to ask and I'm asking. You're not going to give me stone. It, I picture myself knocking at the door of my heavenly Father and saying, Lord, I need help. I need bread. I need an answer. I, and I picture in my mind uh, uh, this father going into the kitchen and getting a big stone and wrapping it up in paper, a newspaper. And he comes to the door, big smile and says, David, I heard you. Here you are. Take it. It seems so heavy. And I get three steps out and open it up and it's a big loaf of stone. And I say, no, 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 no. God wouldn't do that to me. God's not going to give me a stone because he's a loving father. Not even a wicked father could do that. If I ask him fish, is he going to give me a snake? Ask good things. He will give it to you. Ask him to set you free. Ask him to take the shame away from you. Ask him to take your sins. He will do it. He said, ask it. and I'll not give you a serpent. I'll not give you a, 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 a stone for bread. I'll give you what you ask. Take that into the secret closet. Take it and hold God to it. Hallelujah. Go to Ephesians. Turn right to Ephesians 3. I use these every day. Ephesians? Let's see. Where is Ephesians? I've just lost Ephesians here. Ephesians 3. Do you have it? Verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. You take that to God in prayer. You mark that down and every day you go to prayer you take that promise. You say, God... You, you said you'd exceeding abundant everything I ask. I ask you, I want you to over answer my prayer. Do more than I ask you. Have that kind of faith. One more. Psalms. Go back to Psalms. The 91st Psalm, you all know that, don't you? Psalms 91. But there's, there's, there are two verses there that you have got to mark and take to the prayer closet every day. Will you? Psalms 91, verses 14 and 15. Verse 14, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. 
I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life will I satisfy and show him my salvation. Glory be to God. One last word for you. One last word. All right. This is number four. If you want out of this, you have got to trust the Holy Ghost in you. Now listen to me before I close. Just a minute or two here. You have got to trust the Holy Spirit. He, he has been sent by the Father through Jesus Christ into your heart to be your guide and be your comforter. And He has to be acknowledged. You have to acknowledge Him all through the day. You have got to lay before Him when you're crying out to God. You've got to believe that the answer is going to come through the Holy Spirit who abides in you. The Holy Spirit. God doesn't have to do anything else. He doesn't have to send an angel. He's already given you the resources that's in you and that's the Holy Ghost. But you've got to yield to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, you know the way out of this mess. You know what to do. I don't. It's beyond me. I resign. I give up the direction of my life. Here it is, Holy Spirit. I'm going to pray, seek God, call upon Him. Then you have to do the rest. You have to finish it. My part's to call on the name of the Lord. And my part's to believe that the Holy Ghost in me knows the way out. He knows the mind of God. Hallelujah. Will you stand? Yes. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is here. He's been here all day. He wants to do a work of cleansing and healing in our hearts. He wants to bring you out. Now, folks, I have to uh, hold it just a minute. Will you bow your heads? I have got to find out who God was speaking to. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor David, I had to have this message tonight because I've come to wit's end. I have come to the end of the rope and I need his touch. I've got to have him lift me out of this pit and I come to cry out to him tonight. Get out of your seat. Up in the balcony, go to the sides. But there, there's somebody, there's a few, no doubt, that were absolutely despairing of life. You say, Brother David, I can't go on. I felt like ending my life. I want you to come and join these that are coming down the aisle now. Amen. The Lord's here to heal you. Move in closer, please, if you will, please. Hallelujah. Up in the balcony, just go to the stairs on either side and come down the aisle. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Wonderful Savior. All of these who stand before you, Lord Jesus, lift, lift them out of the pit of despair. Lift them out of the despondency. Lift them out of this thing that has come from the enemy of our souls. Lord, there's going to be a deliverance here. You're going to remove fear. You're going to remove fear. You're going to, you're going to let the war, you're going to cause the war to cease. All right, look at me, please. All of you that have come forward, look this way, please. God's going to end your war tonight if you allow Him. He will end it. First of all, there has to be faith. You have got to believe God right now that what you're going through is not something so dreadful and awful that you're the only one going through it. No. Many, many all around through the same thing. So don't get too excited about it saying, well, this is hopeless. It's, it's just not going to work. No, 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 no. That's the beginning of the end of your despair. God's going to deliver you here tonight. Hallelujah. Did you believe the word that you read with me? Did you accept that in your heart? That when you cry to the Lord, He's going to hear and deliver you out of all your trouble? All your trouble? You can't deliver yourself, but God's going to deliver you. That has to be faith. You have to lay hold of that covenant by faith. It's called taking hold of the covenant. God has agreed to stand by His word for He cannot lie. He's made a covenant with you that when He promises you something, He will fulfill it. And the only obligation you have, the only thing you have to do to fulfill the covenant is to believe. To give Him your faith. 
God said, you give me your faith, I'll do whatever's necessary. I will do it. Don't even ask him how. He does it. If you keep on believing him, if you'll hold your faith strong, say, Lord, I give this battle to you. I've confessed my sins. I love you. I believe I'm cleansed. I believe the shame is gone, as Pastor Carter preached. And now, now, Lord Jesus, I'm going to call on you with everything in me. I'm going to cry my heart out to you with faith. Hallowed, not in despair, but in faith. Oh, you may cry out, oh God, where are you? Jesus said, Lord, why have you forsaken me? God, why have you forsaken me? But oh, he cried out. You know he cried out to the point that there were tears. His, 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 he was bleeding with tears of blood. That was how he cried out with such earnestness before his father. Cry out to God. Sometimes, even before you make a sound with your mouth, there's a cry so loud that heaven can hear it. Oh, there's a cry. Oh, God, I need you. God, deliver me. God, hold me. Don't pick up the phone and try to get a counselor. Don't run off to a psychiatrist. Don't take a pill. That's not going to do you any good. What you need right now is say, Oh, God, I believe you. I trust you. You know what I'm going through. You're going to deliver me. Hallelujah. How many have that testimony? God's delivered you from the pits. God's delivered you from the pits. Hallelujah. I want every one of you that are up here now. I'm going to pray for you first. I'm going to have you pray with me. And then I'll close again with prayer. Father, I'm asking that as we pray now, it will become a cry. A cry from the heart. And when I cried, the Lord heard me and delivered me from all my troubles. He heard me. It came into His ear. Oh God, you are not a liar. You cannot lie. The Holy Ghost cannot turn down the cry of one of God's children. He cannot abide in us and turn a deaf ear to our cry. So Lord, we trust you. I want you to pray this from your gut. Dear Jesus, help. I need you. I will call upon you. My heart cries to you. Deliver me from all my troubles and my afflictions and my doubts and my fears. I give them to you, Jesus. Holy Ghost, you abide in me. You live in me. And I know you. And you know me. Make a way. Deliver me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now give Him thanks. Lord, I give you thanks. I give you thanks. You are worthy. This is the conclusion of the message. 